Hawthorne here in Rockingham Forest today with Dan Hoare. Um, he's from Butterfly Conservation. Dan, do you want to tell us a bit about why we're all here and your role and, and what, what it's all about? Yeah, thanks, Tim. So uh, I'm head of Conservation England for Butterfly Conservation. I've been lucky to work for Butterfly Conservation for 15 years now. And my role is um, managing all the landscape scale conservation projects we do across England. We've currently got 21 active projects running across England at the moment. Um, and this is just one of them, but it's one of the most exciting ones. Um, and my role in Back From The Brink is um, helping our project officers who are making the conservation difference on the ground, um, helping them understand what the long-term strategy is, working with all the other project partners, and I sit on the steering group for Back From The Brink as well, which helps us make sure that we fulfil the missions of what the funders want, people like the Heritage Lottery Fund who've really generously supported this project, um, but also learning the conservation lessons so that we can apply them across England. Yeah, great. And uh, obviously the chequered skipper, very exciting times, isn't it? Because it's been extinct uh, in England since 1976, is that right? That's right, yeah. So I think the last records from this landscape were 1975, so probably declared extinct in 76. Almost my whole life it's been absent from this landscape. Um, so it's fantastically exciting to have them back here today and just they're just getting the first spots of sun, so they're starting to fly about for the first time yeah. um, in 40 years, which is brilliant news. Brilliant, very exciting. Well, we're going to have a chat to a couple of the other guys who've been heavily involved in the project now and, uh, and talk a bit further about it. So Sam, Nigel, you work for Butterfly Conservation and you've been involved with this project from the start. How's it, how's it been from those seven years ago now when it started? Seven years for this particular phase. I mean, I was lucky enough to go to Belgium in 1996 to look for checkered skippers really? when we had an earlier PhD study. Uh, yeah, so this feels like the end of a 22 year journey for yes. me. So, wow. uh, yeah. It's a great day. Yeah. And uh, Sam, has it been a, an enjoyable trip over to Belgium the last 48 hours or quite stressful and tiring? Uh, <laughs> both. It yeah. was, it, it's very tiring and very stressful, but fantastic. As you say, it's the end, uh, not quite the end of the road. It's the, the, uh, yes. the we, 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 we're on another journey now as we, we try and get the butterfly established here. But yes, it was great, great um, uh, field work out there, get, yeah. out, get our nets out and go and, go and collect these things. and. Uh, particularly enjoyable working with our colleagues from Belgium. Uh, who, 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 without the, without them, we couldn't have possibly have um, collected these butterflies. Um, we needed their advice about where best to look for them, and so on. So. And why Belgium and not Scotland, where obviously the uh, yeah. the species is found in, in the yeah. UK? Yeah, it's good, a good question. That and and uh, we 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 think the habitat is more similar um, here. Um, to Belgium and it also it, interestingly the caterpillars feed on the same uh, grass which is um, false brome yeah. um, in Scotland they feed on, on purple moor grass so yes, we think right. they may ecologically might be different so I think there's a good reason for trying to, to, to use butterflies from the, s the same habitat yeah, and uh, climatically as well Belgium is much, yes. much closer to here than, course, than yeah. Scotland yeah. And the sort of habitat uh, that you're trying to or have recreated here, hopefully, mm. Mm. Uh, is, is basically sort of lush, uh, sort of semi-shady woodland rides. Really. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. Yes, and, it, yeah. and that's what this species needs, it, it, and that's why it went extinct. It was that, yeah. that uh, these woods became very overgrown uh, in the 40s and 50s. They were coniferized, and that open space that we see around us today is uh, had, had disappeared or largely disappeared, along with the butterfly. So that's all we're trying to create, recreate these open sunny rides. And yeah. Hopefully the butterfly will just get on with it. The sun's <laughs> coming out now, yeah. shall we uh, go and see if we can yeah. find some? Yeah, yeah. So Susanna, I'm here today with you. Do you want to uh, tell us a bit about your role in this? Yes, yeah, so I am the Back From The Brink Rockingham Forest Project Officer. So as the title suggests, I'm looking after this whole project that's happening in the Rockingham Forest area at the moment. Brilliant. And obviously we've heard a bit about butterfly conservation, some of the other partners and people involved in this entire project, but there's been a lot of volunteer hours put in, isn't there? And there will be moving forward. Do you want to tell us a bit about that? Yeah, so we've got, we've, with all the species that we're doing, we're trying to monitor what's going on with these species and where they are at the moment and then resp how they respond to the management work that we're doing. So we're running training workshops for volunteers, so they're involved in surveying for all of these species. And right now we've obviously got volunteers on site monitoring the checkered skipper, what it's doing, which parts of the habitat it's using, because that will help us with our work next year. But we're monitoring for all these different species all year through. So if people were looking to get involved in the project and help you guys out, is there a way that they could put themselves forward perhaps? 
Yeah, so if they want to go to the website, Nature Back from the Brink, they can find out what sort of training workshops we've got coming up if they want to get involved in surveying. But we're also running events like bat and moth nights, wildflower walks, so they can come and see the different habitats and what work we're doing for the different species here. Brilliant. So it's an uh, exciting project, to say the least. Very exciting, very and exciting. it's been a very exciting day. Great. And the sun's shining now, I know, of course, it's fantastic. at last. So <laughs> thanks a lot. Okay. So this is one of the release areas. Um, we took the cage off this morning um, and the butterflies are roosting on the scrub and in the grass and now we're getting the first rays of sun. What is it? It's now half past 11 and right on time the butterflies are starting to open in their wings and bask. They're really solar powered, um, these little butterflies. They're not going to fly until they've got a bit of direct sunlight to warm them up. But now they're all basking and they're going to start getting active. We've had one or two fly off already. Um, and we've got volunteers trying to track them through the wood to see how they're how they're using the woodland. This is a fantastic little butterfly. Doesn't look like much when it's perched up with its wings closed, but when they're basking and when they're zooming around the woodland, really enigmatic, um, exciting little butterfly. Hard to follow, they're very fast flying, a bit of a zigzag flight. But mostly it's the males that you can see. They take prominent perches, occupy a bit of a territory. The females go much more below the radar. They're flying low. Once they've mated, they're just interested in finding some food plants to lay on. They're rain, laying on a range of grasses in here. We think they're probably like most likely to lay on false brome and um, wood small reed in this, in this woodland. But we're going to be watching where the females lay. We're going to be looking for larval damage on all of the food plants and trying to understand how they use the habitat here. And I think it's quite important as well to say it's, it's, this, is, this is good for them, this sort of tussocky. It's not a monoculture, is it? It's not just like really short grazed grass. Or, you know, there's this lovely bit of rush and, and plenty of nectar down here, the bugle, yeah. and a bit of scrub. And they seem to be liking with this wind. They're just, you know, happy to perch in that scrub, aren't they, at the moment? Absolutely. So they really like the shelter. Um, they like damp woodlands, but nectar rich. So we've got loads of bugle here, a bit of stitchwort in flower at the moment. Um, and the Belgian woods where we collected these butterfly butterflies from barely 36 hours ago um, were very similar to this in structure. A whole range of grasses, really varied habitat and that's important because it lets the butterfly choose the right place to live. It can choose uh, where to lay its eggs and where it's best to complete its life cycle. These individual butterflies will probably not live much longer than seven days now. Um, they're quite short-lived, not terribly mobile. Um, most of them will probably not go more than a couple of hundred meters in their life but they will then lay eggs. Those eggs will hatch out after about 10 days, two weeks, um, and the caterpillar will feed um, in the grass. It will roll up the grass stems, um, the grass leaves, with a little bit of silk to, to um, pull the leaves together and into a little tube, and it will feed in that tube all through the summer. So one of the, we think one of the critical things with this species is that the woodland has to be damp enough for those leaves, those grass leaves, to stay lush and green right through to the end of September, even into October, when the caterpillar will still be feeding. And then in late autumn, when it's fed well and it's quite large, it will spin a tighter little um, uh, bit of webbing and it will overwinter, hibernate in, that, in those grass stems um, before coming out again for a brief period, probably only a week in the early spring, um, before it pupates and turns into the next generation of adult butterflies. Um, so fingers crossed, this time next year, um, mid-May, mid-May 2019 is going to be a really exciting time in these woods where we look to see whether we've got the first generation of wild-born checkered skippers flying in England again. Well, Dan, that was fantastic. The first one's just flying now, aren't they? Yeah, now the sun's out, now it's t-shirt weather, that's yeah. when the butterflies really want to get going, so it's fantastic. So now, yeah, they're all flying off and it's down to the to our hard-working volunteers to try and track them and see what we can learn about them. I'm glad I'm not doing that. <laughs> exactly, yeah, it's a tough job. But it's pretty quick, uh, aren't they? Flight, ex then. It's an exciting challenge to be following checkered skippers through English woodland. Oh, God, yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and to see them on nectaring on bugle like that, it's just it's cracking. Isn't yeah, it? brilliant. So already they've been nectaring on bugle, on vetch, um, basking in the sun, and we're really going to get a lot of insights into how they're using this habitat. Yeah. Um, and and hopefully it's just the first of uh, years of watching checkered skippers in these yes, brilliant yeah. woodlands. And moving forward, the management for this site now, what have you got planned? Yeah, well, we, we have to talk to the, the land managers here and on, on neighbouring woodlands. Um, we learned quite a lot just from a brief trip to Belgium, really, looking at the way they manage some of the sites there. Um, so we're going to probably do a little bit of experimental work, maybe um, cut some of the vegetation annually 
um, keep it quite low and others on a longer rotation and then we can of course follow the chequered skippers and see which ones they like best yeah. and what works for the other species that are in here as well because we mustn't forget there's adders and willow tit and other other species here and it, it's a really about fitting chequered skipper into that jigsaw yes, yeah, of, a, yeah. of a woodland landscape. Yeah. And of course moving forwards are you looking to do any more reintroductions of the chequered skipper to this site to boost the population or well, we've got we've got goes. a three year we've got a three year plan um, to do reintroductions. We've got permission for three years. Uh, we're going to watch what they do here. We'll be trying to monitor the larvae and see how successful that is, and then we'll make a decision about whether we release individuals on the same site next year or whether we choose different sites. But ideally, we'd like to put them on more than one site across this landscape um, um, during the next three years to really get them properly established. Brilliant. Yeah. Well, what a day. For yeah. Fantastic. Thank you very Thanks much. Thanks for coming. And, uh, it's been brilliant. Yeah, let's enjoy them a bit more. Yeah. Cheers.